my share screen. Let me get back into here. That's the machine, and I hope you see if we don't have good vacuum, we make like aluminum oxide mirror, and that's a bad mirror. And if we have really good vacuum, like 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 9, then we have a perfect mirror that doesn't have like oxygen in the aluminum. Does everybody see that? And that's really important. So what I wanted to go over quickly is, and this is kind of like a, a bonus, is the uh, vacuum gauges and vacuum pumps. So I don't have that much time, but I wanted to go through them thoroughly and then even give you more stuff on uh, the hardware. So the vacuum gauges, there's different types of gauges that we could use in vacuum technology. So let me go back up in the slides. So here's a gauge, an iron gauge. Here's thermocouple gauges, the TC1, TC2. We could have other things on here. There's not on this machine. but We actually could have a capacitive manometer on here too to do measurement. So on a machine, this is a typical schematic value representation of a process tool. We have these gauges on here. So we want to know about the pumps, and we want to know about the gauges. So I did gauges first. So these are the typical gauges, and this is a capacitive manometer, and its range is from atmosphere to maybe 10 to the minus 6 or so. A TC gauge is a thermocouple gauge, and it goes from atmosphere to 10 to the minus 3. Prawny is a little bit more than that. We're not going to discuss that today. An iron gauge actually has to run 10 to the minus 2 to maybe 10 to the minus 10. And then we're not going to talk about today an RGA, but they're a low vacuum gauge too, but we're, we don't have time for that. So a direct reading gauge, they actually uh, they look at the incidence of flux, right, on the wall. And this can consist of, a, so capacitive manometer is, is probably one of the most important gauges in nanotechnology for vacuum. It's a gauge in which the deflection of a diaphragm is measured by observing the change between the capacitance between it and a fixed counter electrode. It consists of two components, a transducer and a flexible metal diaphragm that converts the physical pressure into an electrical signal. Uh, it's an electronic sense unit that converts the membrane into pressure. So that's true. And then let me see, I'll t turn my video on so I can, maybe that, I think uh, uh, people like to record me while I read the notes or something. I had that turned off, so I just put that back on. So capacitor manometer, let's look at this capacitor equation. And the capacitor equation, like from physics, is capacitance, which is in farads, is equal to epsilon naught, which is a, it's a number that some guy made up, right, Mr. Farad actually made that number up and it's like 8.85 times 10 to the I don't know 19 or something I forget what it is off the top of my head and then it's the area of the plate shown in this diagram uh, divided by the thickness of these conductive plates does everybody see that drawing so this is the this is gives us the permittivity of the dielectric and, and if it's air it's the permittivity of free space if it's like oil it's like two times the permittivity of free space, whatever the permittivity of certain oils are, or mylar, or some other insulating material, or, or ceramic, right? So this is the capacitor equation, and, and the, it gives you the schematic representation of that, and it also shows where these lie in a simple uh, algebraic equation, right? So capacitance equals epsilon naught times the area of the capacitor, divided by the thickness of the capacitor, and this will give us the farad reading. Does that make sense? And what a capacitor does, by definition, like for electrical engineers or for anybody, right, but in the electrical engineering book, it says capacitors block DC and they pass AC signals, right? So that they, they pass lines of flux, but there's no current through a capacitor. That's a scientific rendering of that, right? So that's what we got here. And this shows us what a capacitor manometer looks like on a machine that kind of looks like a can of coke or something uh you know like a can like this usually they're that one's kind of long they're usually shorter dumpier like half of that you know they're usually about half of that uh aspect ratio and that's what it shows schematically over here so there's some wires to electronics and then shown in there is a diaphragm and it's movable one side's like an electrical plate and it's fixed like the top and then the diaphragm is conductive like a metal whoops I was clicking on it but it can flex does everybody see that and so what happens is let me do I have another picture no we'll go back to here 
when I like this plate here on the side, let me get my drawer thing, my annotate. So here I'll draw this. So this plate over here, we're going to say this plate here is it doesn't move. So this one doesn't move. And then this plate on this side, we can make it flexible. And when it flexes, so when it's straight, it's like this. And when it flexes, it can go like this, like in a curve. So what I'm doing now, I have to erase this stuff. Erase, 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 and then hit X on here. So what I'm doing is basically I'm saying I'm drawing this. Here's my fixed plate here up at the top. And then this is the plate shown here like in the pink, red, or whatever that color is. And, and that can move up and down. So I don't know if you can see me in the picture. I guess on your screen you can't see me. But I'm waving my hands back and forth. And, and that means that that plate can actually bow. So this, this plate can go from here. Let me get my annotate out again. My plate can go from straight like this. And then when, it, when the vacuum is in here and it sucks on this vacuum, it's going to take this plate and make it bow like it's shown in the pink. Does that make sense to everybody? So now let me erase that. Erase, oh, didn't get the eraser. Click. Now I'm in eraser mode. Oh, I'm not getting the eraser. Now I'm in eraser mode. Little dot, a couple little dots, and that. And then me X this out. Now I can move forward. So does everybody see that? So it's a moving plate system. So we had a this fixed plate, but one of these plates is actually stretching. And it stretches because inside the middle of this dielectric, that's where we put the vacuum or the hose that goes in there. And so then it sucks it in. Does everybody see that? So for example, say that you have a straw, you know, a straw like you drink with. Does everybody see what I'm talking about? And then we put it in a drink and the drink is something like Coca-Cola. And then we suck on the straw and the Coca-Cola comes up and it's all good. And the straw doesn't collapse due to the pressure that's inside there. But say we have that same straw and the straw is rather flimsy. And we put it into a milkshake that's really frozen. It's like ice cream. Like Wendy sells those Frosties and they're really not a milkshake. There's like ice cream. You put that straw in there and you suck on it and then the sides will collapse. Does everybody see that? And the collapse is you sucking on it. That's the vacuum. And the vacuum is so great that the straw collapses. Does everybody see my analogy? So that's what happens with this. The capacitive manometer, actually, it's going to collapse due to a lot of vacuum pressing those plates together. So the amount of collapse is equal to the pressure that's in the system. So this is a transducer, and what a transducer does is it takes one form of energy to a next, right, or one physical property to a next. So this is telling us that vacuum is equal to farads, and it's actually proportional to the collapse of that capacitor. Does everybody see that? My favorite vacuum gauge is the capacitive manometer because it's so useful, and it's actually the vacuum gauge they use the meter material with to build devices to make things like your cell phone. So if there is no such thing as a capacitive manometer, I really doubt you could have a cell phone. So it's, it's, it's a revolutionary or evolutionary uh, thing that we need to have our vacuum systems work. So capacitive manometer, crazy, crazy valuable thing. Does everybody see that? That's how that works. So there's also indirect reading gauges and a thermocouple gauge is a really good example of this. And this is a schematic of a thermocouple gauge. So it kind of operates like, you know, if you have soup, so here's an analogy again, right, a story, because we don't have math and science, because we have to do this really quickly in this presentation. But say I have a, a, some soup, and it's so hot or chilly, it's so hot, like temperature-wise, if I put it in, it'll burn my lips or burn my tongue. So what do you do to your soup? You blow on it. And when you blow on it, that air hits into the soup, and the air takes away the heat, and it moves it away. Does everybody see that? So now we have the concept that heat can be conducted in air. Does everybody see that? And let's go back to the soup analogy. If I have my soup, and I pick it up with my spoon, and it's really hot, if I let it sit in there for five minutes, the air bouncing off it in the room will actually cool the soup down, right? It does. 
But if I blow on it really hard for 30 seconds, it'll probably do the same work. So that says the impingement of air, the amount of air that's hitting it per unit second, has is, is proportional to wicking away the heat. Does everybody see that? That's what this drawing says. So if I have a constant uh, voltage and I have an ammeter in here, if I have very little gas, like these two blue dots here, if there's only two impinging, then I'm going to take away like two amounts, two units of heat. And then to supply that, to keep this at a constant voltage, a constant temperature, what I'll do is I'll run some amps through here, or milliamp meters, and I'm going to bring back that thermal energy in here to keep this constant. So basically the amps in that gauge are going to be proportional to keep that at a constant voltage. The amps are proportional to the heat loss from the gas. So more gas equals more heat loss. And what I'm going to do is give it more amps. So then I measure the amps, and the amps tell me how much gas is in the machine. Does that make sense to you? So amps equals heat loss. And then I measure the amps, and then the heat loss is equal to pressure which is equal to vacuum. So what we're using here is this engineering principle that we measure one quantity, and that quantity tells me about other quantities. So I'm actually measuring current these through this ammeter. An ammeter is proportional to heat loss, and heat loss is the amount of gas that's in the chamber. So let's go through this exercise. If I'm at atmosphere or I have a fan running, then I'm going to cool down my thermocouple really fast, and I'm going to have a lot of amps, which is going to tell me I'm at an elevated pressure, and I have a lot of air. Does everybody see that? And you guys know this. If I take this gauge and I put it out in space, there is no gas in space. Then there is no heat, and I don't. And then I'm going to measure. I'm going to measure. I'm at vacuum in space. Does everybody get that analogy? So these analogies, looking at these two ends of the spectrum, or you know, looking at the analogy of heat loss in space, like outer space, you know, like astronauts kind of stuff, and then looking at soup or running a fan on something to cool it down, we all know that, right? Like in the summer when you're hot, you run a fan on you, and it helps you dissipate uh, moisture, and then that moisture release actually lowers your energy, right? So it, it acts as a mini air conditioner for us, right? That's why we sweat. So is everybody good? That's how a thermocouple gauge works. And this is what they look like. And then there's no linear relationship. It doesn't work past a millitor because there's not enough gas to make a change. It, it just doesn't have the resolution. It's so little. It doesn't know that the – and we describe vacuum at 10 to the minus streets. It's atmosphere divided by a thousand, which is a really small percentage, and then take that and divide it by a thousand. So at some level, things get to be really, really tiny. And this gauge, actually, because of its physics, it doesn't read below millitor. And that, that's where it ends. So somebody asked the question earlier, like characterization. This is a characterization tool, right? It measures vacuum level. But it actually begins to lie to us, tell us wrong figures. Because it doesn't know the difference between 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, and 10 to the minus 5. It just says 0. And it, it can't go below that. So it has that range to where after that range, it gives us like false data because it all looks like 0 to that. Does that make sense? In fact, I'm working on a machine for a colleague of mine, and that's what we have. We have that problem. The problem is the iron gauge doesn't turn on or it's burned out. And I told him it, it should come on because it should be below 10 to the minus 3 because there's two thermocouple gauges on there, and they're at zero. And the, thermo, and the ion gauge is telling us that we're above that. And I'm like, well, two gauges are telling us the other gauge is broken. That's the ion gauge. So does everybody see that? And, and one of the reasons that it's not such a good gauge, it says in here, there's no linear relationship. It's because different gases actually have a different heat capacity. So it doesn't look at individual gases. It looks at the average of the heat capacity. And so it's not a very accurate gauge, but it's a very useful gauge. But it, it lies a little bit. It, it doesn't know that it, it has like low resolution. Does that make sense? It tells us something like, 
you know, if we, if it was a person, it would say somebody's in, with their eyes closed. It could say, I hear somebody in the room, but I don't know who it is. So that's low resolution. Does that make sense? Because it can't discern between different people because it has its eyes closed. And the eyes in this representation would be individual heat capacity. That would be indicative of individual gases. So it's going to take an average of that, just like hearing or vision. They're, they're more or less representative of, of our ability to discern things. So uh, this is what we're seeing with a TC gauge. TC gauge takes an average. And, and so this scientific stuff isn't used. So TC gauges aren't that God awful accurate, but they're really good to tell us when to turn robots on or when to turn other gauges on or if it's safe or not. Does that make sense? But it's not the gauge I use to, to measure pinches of atoms to, to build materials. It's more like a gauge I would use in some senses as a story, just telling you a story. It's a gauge I use like for robotics and to control valves and to know things are safe or are that other. To measure things is like a pinch for how many atoms I need to make something in nanotechnology. I'm going to go ahead and use the capacitive manometer for that. So this, this gauge, the TC gauge, isn't as scientifically good as a, a capacitive manometer. But it costs 100 times, well, probably 20 times less. And the most used gauge on a nanotechnology machine, the one we see the most often, like if I go back up to this drawing, we see there's a bunch of TC gauges on her. There, there's TC gauges like crazy on every machine. There's usually like one ion gauge, one capacitive manometer, and six or seven or 10 TC gauges. So while they're no, the most scientific machine going, or tool, or gauge, whatever you want to call it, they're the most prolific, which means they're the most the most gauge you'll find on a, a process tool. And then there's ion gauge. So we saw on our other evaporator example, there's something called an ion gauge. And it actually measures uh, uh, gases down to 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 10. So that's crazy because those numbers are like insane. Does everybody see that? These numbers are like millions numbers, like million billion. And for people, it's kind of hard to get an idea of numbers that are that big because we have things like 10 fingers and 10 toes. And we could see three miles away. And we, we judge time in days or months. We, don't, we can't see millennia, right, in our mind. So people as an intuitive thing, we don't know what vacuum is. It's, it's really difficult to know. We don't know what millions of a centimeter are. But an ion gauge is, is, is like uh, binoculars or something, right, or microscopes. They allow us to, to take our human form and expand it because now we can see gas at 10 to the minus 6 levels. So they're a real tool. So, you know, an ion gauge itself is kind of like a characterization tool, and I, I want everybody to appreciate that. So what it contains is a hot filament, a positive grid, and an ion collector. And that's what this bad guy looks like. It looks like a light bulb. So this is a thing I'm working on upstairs, one floor up from me. A colleague of mine had problems with the machine, and I'm kind of like a vacuum expert. So what does that mean? It means people buy me coffee often because they have problems, and they know I can help them, and they know I won't do it unless they buy me a cup of coffee. So I usually have a lot of coffee. So the guy next door owes me a cup of coffee because I'm helping him with his vacuum problems, right? So that's what this guy looks like, this vacuum thing. And I don't have a schematic here oh, in my presentation. I must have, I, I, my, my general vacuum thing takes nine hours, 12 hours. So you guys are getting a real abbreviated version in three hours, right? I was told to quit at four o'clock. I got to look at my iPhone. Wee, she's quarter to four now, so I better, better pick up the pace. But this is what the vacuum gauge does. And basically what it has with these grids in here, let me go back and draw something. Th this drawing will be terrible, but I'll try to do it anyhow. I have this thing called an iron gun like this. It has a sharp tip on it. And I'm gonna heat it up. And what it's gonna do is it spits out electrons. It boils them off. 
So it's like an electron paint can or something. And then over here, I'm going to have a grid, and this grid is going to go to ground. Does that make sense? So these electrons are going like this. So it's basically it kind of looks like a machine gun. So shoot not bullets at a hillside. Does everybody see that analogy? So my emitter tip is shoot not electrons just like a gun shoots out bullets, like an automatic weapon, right? Like a, a belt fed machine gun. And then what I'm going to do here is I have a, a representation I'm going to draw below. Let me see if I get real fancy. I don't know how to do this. Can I get a different color? uh format oh yeah check it out i'm going to get another color so now i did another color so i have a material in here like this shown in blue and this is just i'm just making a cartoon does everybody see that there's no like x's but it has this it has four it's a group four material so on on the outer core it has four electrons does that make sense to everybody so if i have a bunch of gas like this a bunch of these x's going around here in my machine this is my machine right this is inside my gauge if I send a gas like in this direction and it goes through this electrical field some of these atoms are going to be hit by this electrical field and when they come out the other side they're going to look like this they're going to have one missing electron right here and then maybe some like this So there'll be three electrons on it instead of four, and then it's going to be missing an electron. We're going to call that a positive ion. Does everybody see that? That's what I just made. This is my electron gun, and what does an electron gun do? Excuse me, in my case, it's going to make electrons, and that's what it does. So, I mean ions, I'm sorry. So it takes uh, atoms, and it ionizes them. Does everybody see that? So now that I have an ion, a plus charge, so I'm drawing on the other side of the screen, what does an ion want more than anything else? So this is part of this system. It wants to go to ground. So here's ground, and I'm going to draw it like this. And then here's the ground symbol, right, like this thing. But in here, I'm going to put an ammeter, like an A. So my ions go like this, and they go down to here, and this is basically ground. When they do, an electron comes up from ground. An electron's going by a point or amps. Does everybody recall that from their electrical engineering or physics training? So when I have an ion, it goes down to ground, but when it goes to ground, it gets counted as amps. Does everybody see that? So this is the number of electrons to have this ion right here let me go back this one right here to have this go back and get an electron because that's what it wants so that's shown over in this picture does everybody see that so that's what this does so let me hit an x oh now oh my i gotta go back to annotate and erase all this so do I have an, I still have a pen. Uh, now I got an eraser. I have to erase all this. Or it shows up on the other slides. I have another software package on some other presentation because I do online presentations in that package. It's just you erase the whole slide. I don't know how to do that in this one. So I'm sorry this takes so long. You know, I don't want to be doing it either. This is real tedious work. Although those, those, those electrons worked out pretty good. I'm, overall, these drawings are terrible, but I'm kind of proud of them because I can actually do worse. I can do worse on a good day. So this is an excellent day. But I can't draw. That's why I'm an engineer, right? Or I'd be an artist. Well, I don't, I'm not gifted in art anyhow either, so I couldn't do that. So suspiciously, they're calling this an ion gauge. So you have to know that they make ions. So what we do is we take the gas, we ionize it, and then we count it. 
So if there's a lot of gas inside my chamber and I'm, I'm like towards atmosphere, how many ions am I going to get? A zillion. And if I'm at 10 to the minus 10 and there's hardly any gas in my chamber and I ionize it, how many ions am I going to get? Hardly any at all. Does everybody see that? So ionized gas is proportional to gas that's in my chamber. And the recombination of the electrons to the ions to let them go back to a neutral state, that count is proportional to the gas. Does everybody see that? So there's this cascade of ideas that says, I take the, the residual gas that's in my machine, with my ion gauge, what I do is I ionize it. And if there's a lot of ions, then I count a lot of ions with my gauge. And that tells me the relative vacuum level. If there's hardly any gas in my machine and I try to ionize it, then I get hardly any ions and I count that. And since I have hardly any ions, I know that I have no gas in my machine or very little which gives me an accurate reading of the vacuum level that's in the machine. Does everybody see that? So what's the claim to fame of the ion gauge? It actually operates below 10 to the minus three. So it's actually, it gives us better resolution or deeper vacuum than the ion gauge that we would use as a TC gauge. Does everybody appreciate that? So I'm gonna go back up to my drawing again, just to show you this. And I know this is tr tremendously fast, so, but this is the time that they gave me, you know. But you could learn a lot. You can play this video. This is recorded. So play it back. Watch other YouTube videos on this, and, and you'll get it. But see, this is my high vacuum gauge right over here, the ion gauge. And then these are the TC gauges. So the TC gauge is, is, is going to run out of steam. It's only going to measure 10 to the minus 3. So how do I know my, my, my vacuum pump that goes to 10 to the minus 6 is working? I'm going to use my iron gauge to measure that. So going back to the drawing and showing you this. So th this is difficult to understand all this vacuum technology in one day. But let me tell you a story. I'm glad I'm doing it because you might have to watch this video a couple times or being able to ask me questions. This is a valuable day because before you came in, you didn't know much. And when you leave, you're going to know more. And that's a success. So, you know, I hope we're laying a good foundation here that you could even read some more stuff or watch other videos or the next presenter, he's going to talk more about vacuum and you understand his stuff because we were able to have a legitimate discussion today, you know, and you were legitimate students that wanted to learn because I can say all the things I want, but if you're not listening, learning ain't happening. Learning don't happen on my side of the microphone. It happens on your speakers. So hopefully you guys are getting all this. It's not that bad once you know it, though, but it's intimidating when you first do it. But, you know, well, like I said, I wanted volunteers. You can't be scared. Everybody doesn't know, and you have to look stupid. And then you learn, then you're less stupid at the end of the day. And that's all you can do. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid you don't know, or don't be afraid this looks like crazy, because it is crazy. But if you take your time, you could learn that, right? So, yeah. And there's other gauges. So there's varied and prolific, right? That means there's all kind of gauges. So I just scratched the surface, because that's all the time I had for you guys. But you could look all these things up, these individual things like a piranha gauge or hot filament iron gauge. and cold cathode gauges, capacitive manometers. You could look these up just on Wikipedia. Does everybody see that? So hopefully I gave you enough background that you could be able to now understand Wikipedia on like a capacitive manometer. I'm not saying the first time you read it, you'll understand it. But as an engineer, I'll tell you a little story. You don't read things once. You read them a dozen times. And you cry because you don't understand it. And the, maybe the 13th or 14th time, then you understand it. So you just have to be tough. So be tough. And, and when you don't know, you just find out how about it. That's why you have a whole summer to do this.
So don't don't get freaked out. So vacuum pumps, they're selected and used based on a number of criteria. All of these things. But as an engineer, can you have everything at once? No. So you're like, hey, my pump has to do corrosive stuff like phosphine and, and, and poisonous stuff like phosphine. And it has to do things that are pyrophoric like phosphine. It has to do things like oxygen. So you select the pump. There's different pumps. Just like we showed all these gauges, there's all these pumps, all kinds of different kinds that we're going to look at. But you're, as an engineer, and you don't have to know that from this presentation, but as an engineer, you look at your materials, your product, your gases, and then there is a right pump for the right job. And, and when you take classes like this or go back to college and learn vacuum technology, I teach vacuum technology here at Penn State and, and online, right? Like to you guys, right? So, you know, you, you, you take classes on this and then you could pick the right pump for the right application. Does that, does that make sense? In fact, this is kind of crazy. Let me throw this thought out at you. If I had the same machine, identical, ran the same gases, identical, and then I changed the pump from one type to another, my product will change. Even though they pumped on to 10 to the minus 6, it'll change the product. What does that mean? One day I have a pump on there and it breaks and I'm making good heart valves for the hospital, heart valves that save people, right? And then I changed the pump to a different brand, a different type, because I, I didn't go to a good school, and I think that that's equivalent, but it's not. And then I start making heart valves, and people start dying. So that's not good, huh? Don't want people dying from when you make products. So there's a little insight. So you have to know about these things. Does that make sense? And when you go to school, you'll know, you know, but that's that's what you have to you know it's a skill and once you have it can everybody see there's jobs because everybody doesn't think at that level is everybody hip like that to be an engineer means you're very dedicated and to be an engineer means you make a tremendous amount of sacrifice in time and you, and you take a tremendous emotional load because you read a technical paper you don't understand it and you read it again and you don't understand it that's a lot of stress and then you read it again and you finally understand it but then that's a lot of reward so think of that so if you're an engineer at the end of the day you probably make a lot of money but at the end of the day you probably have a lot of self-respect and you probably help a lot of people and that's worth more than money that's true so here's the typical ranges for pumps. How about it? So we have all kind of different pumps, and we don't have time today. But I wanted to show you this exact thing. I think a good definition of an engineer is a value decision maker. We look at the pumps. We look at the application and say, what's the best pump for the job? Does everybody see that? They got people do this in life. So here's an analogy like a story that doesn't have anything to do with engineering. There's people in life, and they're kind of weird. We call them golfers, so they golf. There's like this little white ball, really nice places, and then they have the ball in front of them, and then they hit it and knock it away, and then they chase it. That's the game of golf. Does everybody see that? Pretty crazy. Golfers are crazy, crazy dudes. And what they do is when that ball's sitting there, somebody else walks up to them, their helper, and says, you want to hit that ball far, low, high, to the right – use this particular club so they do the right club to hit the ball the certain distance does that make sense i don't know if you know this about golf but for the most part you have a consistent swing but to get the ball to go higher lower a certain distance you actually change the club so the face of the club is a different angle the mass is different and using the same swing same rotation the ball will go a different distance so if you know you want to go 200 yards, you get a certain number of golf club. If you want to go 400 yards, you get a different number golf club. So selecting the right tool for the right job is the craft of being a good golfer or a good golf caddy because the caddies are often their consultants that, that give a second opinion to the professional golfer to say what club to choose. Does everybody see that? 
And as engineers, that's what we do. We select the right not club for golfing, but we select the right pump for the right application. Does everybody understand that? That's really the message that I want to get across in the vacuum pump section. So I wanted to tell you that. So these are the different pumps that we have and the mechanical pump diffusion cryo. So let's take a look at them. The first pump only goes to 10 to the minus three. We call that the rough pump, and that's what it does. It goes from atmosphere to 10 to the minus three. And we looked at, if you look back in the notes, there's a rough section that says that, right? And that's what this pump does. So they generally look something like this. Uh, my daughter, I should show you on my cell phone, she just sent me a text. And it was about, because she does science, she's getting her second doctorate degree here at Penn State, doing cancer research. So I'm really proud of my daughter. So shout out to my daughter who's doing cancer research. Proud of you is my, I mean, your dad. Proud of you, daughter. You know, so she just sent me a thing. She's like, got problems with vacuum pumps, dad. I know you do stuff like that. So I sent her, I'll charge her a consulting fee or at least a cup of coffee, uh, you know, to help her out with her things. But she was working with a mechanical pump and the oil was bad in it. So I had to tell her about that. I just sent her text. It was my last text on my phone was 10 texts to my daughter talking about pumps. But they generally look like this. And for a, a, a chamber that's as big as a, you know, put your arms around stuff that I'm talking about in general that we use, you know, that you'll see when you go to labs here in your research this summer, th those chambers will be that you can put your arms around them for the most part. And a pump will be about big as like two or three loaves of bread. Does everybody get that? So that thing that you're seeing there isn't big as a pickup truck. It's big as two or three loaves of bread. And I guess everybody here is like English units instead of metric. So I'm going to say that that's like 70 pounds. So you could pick that up probably. Does that make sense? 70 pounds is pretty heavy, but a single person could pick that up. You know, so that's about what they are. And this pump will go down to 10 to the minus 3 tor. And, and that's good, but at 10 to the minus 5, or 5 times 10 to the minus 4 tor, that's when we peel all the water vapor. Water would sublimate off the walls in a vacuum system. So we like to go to minus 6s to make sure that we get all the water out. So if we add a tool, let me go back to this drawing so that you know what my discussion is. This picture might help us out. I can actually, in this drawing, I have this turbo pump. I could eliminate that and just go strictly with my mechanical pump and not have a turbo. Then my chamber would only pump to 10 to the minus 3. If I did this evaporator, then I would have to have, I would have like really poor quality aluminum because it'd be like aluminum oxide, aluminum nitride, and it wouldn't be so shiny, but it would be like silvery color and it'd be okay. That might be good enough to make like a Toyota, like get a piece of plastic and coat it with aluminum to make it look silver and put that on the back of a truck because it's not a heart valve it's, it's a toyota symbol right it might be good enough to make something like a fishing lure right kind of shiny so the fish bite it but you're going to lose it in three casts anyhow so it doesn't have to be perfect so that would be what they call the junk industry that would be for stuff that's not like electronic grade or biomedical we could actually run an evaporator evaporate like really crappy aluminum like it's not very pure but that might be good enough for stuff like potato chip bags and, and Christmas wrapping, you know, Christmas paper or something like that or bows or something like that to put on top of a dog. Like I got girl dogs. We put bows on them. They don't like that. But my wife thinks it's cute. It is kind of cute. They're kind of. I got Labrador retrievers. You ever want to get a dog, get a lab. They're really good dogs. Really friendly. They love to eat, too. So you can't put cookies on a table. That don't happen. You put cookies on a table, come back, no cookies on the table. So well, labs will be happier, though. But you have to watch that. So here's an oil sealed rotary vein pump. And basically, we have this piston ring showed here as number five in A. And it goes around in a circular fashion with oil in there. And it's like a compressor but it's doing compression in opposite. It's draining air out of a, a, a chamber. And that's how we operate this. Does that make sense? So the piston never hits the piston wall. And in your car, your piston in your car, like a V8 car or whatever, V, not four, like a straight four cylinder in a car, 
the piston doesn't hit the cylinder wall in a car, there'd be so much friction it would like damage your car, right? So your piston never hits the cylinder wall. There's always a layer of oil. That's why you put oil in a car. That makes the seal. So you have the piston ring made out of metal. You have the cylinder wall made out of metal. And then they don't hit each other. There's this very thin layer of oil in there. But that oil acts as a seal. Does everybody see that? Beyond a certain level of vacuum, that seal will break down. And you'll get air to bubble through it. And they call that like back streaming. That's the technical term for that. So the oil breaks down. That the, the air can actually seep through that oil. So there's a metal, oil, metal seal. That oil, air will be able to diffuse through that rather rapidly below 10 to the minus 3. So no matter how big your pump is, it goes to 10 to the minus 3. So I said this pump right here is big as a couple loaves of bread and weighs 70 pounds or so. That's true. For a machine that you can put your arms around, that's true. But you could have a machine that's as big as the room that you're in. That's true. That pump would probably be as big as a, your couch or something or a chair. And people can't pick it up. You're going to need a forklift. But that's only going to pump to 10 to the minus 3, even though it's so much bigger. But it's going to be able to use, it's going to be able to move a big volume of air. Does everybody see that? So it'll be able to pump a room down to 10 to the minus 3 but because of the volume, but it doesn't go below that. So the bigger the pump, still 10 to the minus 3. Smaller pump, still 10 to the minus 3. Because of the physics of this oil, this metal to oil to metal seal. Does everybody get that? It has a certain uh, analogy to cars. In fact, cars pull vacuum. There's like vacuum in the manifold of a car that pulls down fuel to feed the cylinders in an internal combustion engine, right, for, for an automobile. So mechanical pumps, and then everything in engineering. So I'm trying not just to teach you vacuum today. So uh, what, what people say, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they say that, that, that I teach just engineering in general, just not specifically things. I want to tell you as an engineer, you're a value decision maker. So you look at the positive and negative things, weigh them out or weigh out types of pumps, and then select a pump that's appropriate, right? Does that make sense? So for everything in engineering, you should look at aluminum, you should look at gauges, you should look at pumps, you should look at machines, you should look at all kinds of stuff and say, hey, what's positive here? And what's negative here? And what's important? And I never can have a perfect world. But what, what's, what's the closest I can get to a perfect solution? Does everybody see that? So in engineering, energy is neither created nor destroyed. You can't make mass. You can't have perfect. There's always losses. Does everybody see that? But we, we, we try to minimize these things, right? So we deal with the finite, and and we use the we make the best of that. So we control lists like this: advantages and disadvantages. And this tells us how these things work. If somebody said go buy a pump, I'd probably say two or three thousand dollars, just so you know that. And you could look these things up. But that that's that's about that. So these are these are super common pump, and 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 probably the most common pump that you can buy. So this is the oil backstreaming that we've discussed already. And I'm trying, let me go look at my iPhone here. Oh, I'm about at the time I need to be anyhow. So let me try to wrap things up here a little bit, go to one more and then we'll be done. And then there's different types of pumps, oils. So I just talked to my daughter. It's crazy. Like the first time I ever talked about my, to my daughter about vacuum pumps was when Asama was giving you the introduction to this. Isn't that bizarre? It's like a, a glitch in the matrix, right? So that, that's kind of crazy. So there's different types of pump oil. There's oil that you could use with uh, just air. And then there's oil that you would use with high percentages of oxygen. So we know oxygen at air is like 21%. But if we run a pure oxygen bottle that had 100% air in it, we couldn't use carbon oil 
because it would be like a diesel engine. It would actually, under high compression, it would explode and burn. It would combust. So what we do is we don't use combustible oil. It makes sense. We use non-combustible oil, which would be synthetic oil. And the brand names for those are like Fomblin and Crytox. And that's like saying a chocolate bar is like a Hershey bar, right? So there's a specific name. So these are proper names like, you know, name brands. But those are the name brands that are most popular. And that oil typically is, you know, hundreds of dollars a quart compared to $10 a quart. So it's really expensive. And this is a mechanical pump system. And if we had like an evaporator in here or some other system, this is what it would look like. We would have like these valves on here, TC gauges to measure the pressure, et cetera. And then we would be able to pump this chamber down to 10 to the minus three. And that would be good for this. Does everybody see that? They have these valves on here. I wanted to tell you, when you turn a pump on, just in, for vacuum technology, you never turn it off. You have a valve and then you close the valve and the pump still runs. That way you isolate it, excuse me, from your vacuum chamber. But there's all kind of pump choices. So I put these in the presentation so you could, you know, type these in the Google bar and, and learn even more. So, you know, you know, I wanted to give you a presentation uh, within my limited time, which I and thank, you know, the, our hosts here for the ability to communicate with you, hopefully help you in your lives and, and teach you about vacuum. But I only had so much time. So, you know, I'm giving you these things that you could go and type in and, and learn more about if you're interested in vacuum. And then there's there's a dry pump. It doesn't use oil because that's what the indication of dry is, is no oil. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's not as good as a, a, a typical oil pump goes to 10 to the minus 3, like 10 millitor. These usually only go to 250, so they're not as good base pressure-wise as a wet pump. Uh, and they're expensive as all get out of time. I mean, like crazy expensive, five or ten times more than a, than a wet oil pump. And they break down a heck of a lot more often. So they're cleaner, and vacuum is clean, right? And they're really appropriate for like biomedical, but they cost more. Does everybody see that? So here's things in life. I'm going to tell you something in life that's not nanotechnology. Things that cost more are often a lot of times better. <laughs> so just, just, just like that. Does everybody see that? So here's another thing. To have a lot of money is actually pretty cool, no matter what anybody says. It's nice. If you won the Powerball, I'm telling you, you'd probably be pretty happy. But then again, when you win the Powerball, the average Powerball winner like loses all their money in three years or something silly. And at least that's the, the internet rumor, right? If I won the Powerball, I'd be happy. I'd change my name and shave my mustache, and uh, I'd be I'd be pretty happy. So here's pumps and what they cost, right? So I said a regular pump is maybe two or three thousand. You can see that these are six or ten. Does everybody see? And this is other high vacuum pumps. What they're made out of. There's other things like oil diffusion, cryogenic, and turbo molecular. So a diffusion pump, it runs on oil, and the oil shoots down. And it actually, that's like that stream, that mass, pulls other mass with it, which is the air. So it's like a fan blade, but it's not a fan blade, it's oil. So the oil stream actually is the mass, the oil mass, hits the mass of the air, so it's a kinetic transfer pump. And we can see that that's moderately dirty because of the oil in there, but on top of this diffusion pump, we're going to have a filter. And that filter is probably going to be a liquid nitrogen filter. Uh, that has fan, like blades on it. So if there's oil vapor that comes up, it's going to hit into that and then condense. So let's look at how this works. So we heat up the oil down at the bottom, like really hot, and it goes through the center of this tube, and then it gets sprayed down. When it sprays down, it moves air with it. Then it moves the air and the spray hits the walls, and the walls are cold with water. When when the when the hot vapor hits the wall, walls, it turns the liquid again. And then it goes through a cycle and it just it's a continuous loop. Does everybody see that? So you can kind of picture like a fountain in a pond. It's kind of like that. Does everybody see? And and that that vapor spraying down is going to pull air with it. So this is kind of like that vapor kind of acts like a fan blade 
in a fan that you would put in your apartment. Does everybody see that? But it's not a blade like you'd have in a fan. It's the oil is actually the fan blades. Think about it. Look it up on the internet. You'll see. So this is the advantages and disadvantages of those pump. And that's what you want to see. And over your course and, and your summer trip here, you know, your experience, you want to start thinking like this because this is how engineers think. And then there's different types of oil. This tells you that oil. I think I probably tell you what it costs. No, I guess I didn't. I might have deleted some slides because I had to pare down my presentations naturally for this short time period, right? And this is a diffusion pump system, what it would look like. It needs a backing pump. This 10 to the minus 3 hook to the exhaust on here too. But it would be the same basic thing. A lot of times these diffusion pumps are in stuff as big as a room. And they would coat sheets of glass that are 10 feet by 10 feet, right? And that would be the nanotechnology there. We would put on like UV filters and stuff like that, metal coatings on glass. So like your furniture doesn't fade in your house, those kind of things. And that would that's nanotechnology, even though it's a 10 by 10 sheet of glass. And then there's cryogenic pumps. That's pretty interesting. We would take all the air, and you wouldn't think of this, but you can turn air into ice. So there could be things like argon ice, hydrogen ice, water ice, naturally, right? But you could have nitrogen ice. Nitrogen turns to a liquid, and it can also turn to a solid. So you have to have a refrigerator like this. The refrigerator is actually, it captures all the gas. And that's an, an entrapment and trainment system. So there's cryogenic pumps. They're very, very popular and very, very clean. The disadvantage is we really don't like to run things in there like high oxygen because then we make like liquid oxygen. And then I hope you know you use things like liquid oxygen to, to send rockets to the, mule, to the moon, right? So that's a heck of a fuel. So we don't like to do that. So I'll tell you another thing in nanotechnology. We're generally not allowed to blow things up. So you can't have like labs exploding things like that so we don't put pure oxygen in cryo pumps because that would break the rules we would have big explosions so we're not allowed to do that and, and that's that's probably pretty fortunate does everybody see that so we're not allowed to make explosives generally in nanotechnology and then for cryo advantages and disadvantages how about it guys that's what we do and then here's the generic system you could look through the notes and review that then there's a turbo. You guys can see how a turbo pump works. It's basically these fan blades. Does everybody see that? But what you wouldn't see is these things spin at 40,000 RPMs, and, and that's so fast you can't even hardly envision that. And they'll be able to pump assist. They're like a jet engine. Does everybody see that? It, it's very similar to a jet engine. So we put this jet engine kind of on a, on a vacuum chamber. Boy, does that pump that thing down. My favorite pump is the turbo pump for good reason. Does everybody see that? My favorite gauge is probably a capacitive manometer because it scientifically is so cool. And my favorite pump because of the advantage list, disadvantage list, I'd say I like the turbo. Does it do everything? No. But in most cases, turbo is probably a really, really good pump to go with. And one of the reasons is, excuse me, I got to drink water. I got <clears throat> the cough. One of the reasons is it could do high oxygen in corrosive environments. Does everybody see the second bullet point there? And, and other pumps don't do that rather well. So in aggressive environments, which is a lot of environments in nanotechnology, the turbo pump is, is really a, a winner for that. Not all applications, but most. A, a turbo is pretty universal. They they tend to be twenty grand, twenty thousand bucks for a generic one. I'm just saying, like, how much does an average car cost? There's there's a range, right? But how much does the average turbo cost for the average machine for the average application? It's tens of thousands of dollars, maybe twenty k or something like that. Just a good number. They're kind of expensive, right? But they're pretty handy, good pump. I like them. They're a good pump. So th they're my favorite pump. So. If you want to look up other stuff outside the classroom, maybe that's one you want to go to Wikipedia and look up, right? After I gave you this hand-waving quick description on a, what is today, 
Tuesday or something. I don't even know what day it is. Look at my iPhone. Oh, it's Monday. iPhone says it's Monday. I don't even know what day it is. I should have known it's Monday. I pretended it's Tuesday. The closer it is to Friday, the happier I get. That's it for everybody. How about it? So here's the turbo pump. Here's a schematic. You guys are just loving this. Another schematic. Beautiful. Dry pumps. So that's the end of vacuum. So I gave you some more notes. I edited them a little bit. I, I have a hard time getting a presentation unless I polish it that day. So I, I changed a couple slides that you guys have. I might have edited one or two slides out for, you can see why, right? Because I'm over my time already probably. Oh, I'm bought right at the right time. But uh, this covers the basics. There are many more details that, we, we, that are very valuable. So now I wanted to ask questions, but I do want to say thanks for inviting me as a speaker. And then if you go further on, there's mass flow controller discussion, vacuum hardware talks about all these things. And uh, I thought that would be good that you'd have that or even help out your next presenter that's going to talk about from uh, NCU. They're going to talk more about vacuum. So, I, I, you know, as a, a bonus, right, I gave you those slides if you desire to look more like that. So uh, uh, let's say, hey, hey, Pat, any questions for my students on that end? Do good, good work. Do good work in life young students <laughs> no uh any more questions no. they said you're very thorough terry oh yeah i am i'm i'll tell you what i'm really proud people call me hardcore they're just <laughs> like he's a man and like you like i i will like i'll walk through glass over fire because it's the right thing to do you know, I try to be very thorough. And it's really nice. It makes my life easy because I never have to do anything twice and I try to do things right. I'm trying to give you like things you'd learn reading fortune cookies. Does everybody see that? So it's my role in life as an older person to pass you on good and to wish you good. And, and I wish you that. I wish, I wish that you're thorough too because it's really good for an engineer to be thorough. Engineers aren't thorough. What happens? Planes wreck. Bridges collapse. Don't be that engineer. Not at all. How do you sleep at night if you do something like that? That's tragic. As an engineer, we have a tremendous amount of responsibility. Do you guys see that? We have a tremendous amount of satisfaction. We generally make a tremendous amount of money. But we hold people in our their lives in our hands. You know, we make bad tires and cars wreck. We make bad airbag sensors and babies die. We make bridges that collapse. That's terrible. So there's a lot of responsibility being an engineer. It's not a joke. So, you know, but it's fun too. You know, it's fun to be serious. It, it, and there's a lot of reward in being an engineer, certainly. Questions, guys? I think we're good from here. Again, thank you very much, and enjoy your summer. I'm going to talk to you guys a couple more times. I'm going to do lithography for you in a week or two, and then one of the things that I do that I enjoy very much, and I'm proud of my daughter, I work on biomaterials and try to do things like solve cancer. How beautiful is that? So, you know, we'll talk about those things. So coming to summer here might change your life. That would be great if you could actually – improve people's lives in biology or, or, or cure a disease or something. Boy, that's a calling. How about it? So, you know, I, I'd like to talk to you about that, I think, in three weeks. So I'll, I'll be proud to do that too. So anyhow, uh, good Monday to everybody, and, and please work hard in the summer. It's important for you. All right. Thank you very much.